Hello, friends and adventurers. Our podcast has been supported for months now by Misty Mountain Gaming, and they're now rewarding you, our listeners, with savings on all their fine D&D products such as metal dice, stone dice, glass dice, miniatures, adventures, dice trays, and more. You can use the code TWINS10, that's T-W-I-N-S-1-0, to save 10% on all purchases made in their online store at MistyMountainGaming.com. Every code redeemed helps support Steven and I, and encourages us to make more and better content for you. So be sure to use code TWINS10 whenever you're buying premium Dungeons & Dragons dice and gear from our good friends at MistyMountainGaming.com. Okay, on with the show. We're going to start with dying. It's basically the magical equivalent of a cyanide pill. If you can fly, you're basically a telepath. Clerics are better paladins and monks. I would rather something die than run away from me. (laughs) You told me to do this now. It's not my fault. I was going to say this for the end. You already started. Don't blame this on me. Welcome back, friends and adventurers, to another episode of Bardic Twinspiration, a topical Dungeons & Dragons podcast where my brother and I talk about our favorite hobby. I'm the D&D wannabe. My name is Rob. And I'm Steven. Welcome back as we continue to look through the final pages of the playtest material that we have been given for 1D&D, covering the Druid and the Paladin. Rob and I have already discussed each of these classes individually over the course of two episodes each, and now we're coming back right here at the end to just take a look at the non-class-based features that we've been presented with. Right, every Unearthed Arcana has come with some changes to spells or feats or just the bones of the game, the base mechanics, and we're here to look at what they've done to it all this time, (laughs) (laughs) because... When, at least when they give you a class, they kind of leave it alone for a while. But every UA changes this section radically. In today's episode, we're going to be covering a couple more of the epic boons that have been made available to the final two classes in the Priest group. After that, we're going to take a look at a couple of the changes to some of the spells from what you might be familiar with in D&D, wrap it up with a couple of playtest rule changes that they implemented, and finally spend a few minutes talking about our thoughts on this particular playtest packet as a whole. Before we get into doing all of that, how have things been going, Steve? Things have been busy. I know that we're in podcast time right now, so for all the listeners out there, it probably seems like it's been just a week or two since they last heard from us on the Paladin episode, but in real life, it has been something like a month or a month and a half because Rob has been on the road doing several different conventions, including, I believe, this was your first time going to GaryCon, which I know is one that is near and dear to the hearts of this community. GaryCon was a bunch of fun. It was was so unlike any other convention convention that I have been to, and it is the one now that I cannot wait to return to. And following that was C2E2, which is before I tried GaryCon, C2E2 was that con for me. Now, GaryCon is still that con, but it's it was easily uh, two of my favorite weekends, probably of the year, are already out of the way now. So if you had a really long time in between the Druid and Paladin episodes and you were wondering what happened to Bardic Twinspiration, just understand that half of the team was having fun instead. (laughs) But I'm glad that you went to it because it sounds like you had a lot of fun. And I believe the coolest thing that you told me about happening, I know you said you met this guy and that guy and all this sort of stuff, but apparently the cape that my wife made you for Christmas was worn not only by you at this convention, but also by Gary Gygax's son. (laughs) Yes. That sounds like the coolest part of the trip to me. Getting to meet him and him graciously agreeing to wear the cloak was very good. He's a much larger man than I am in most dimensions in a healthy, athletic sort of way. So it actually fit him better than it fit me. (laughs) Steve, I know the past couple of weeks you've been busy as well doing some D&D-related stuff. You have seen through the launch of Misty Mountain Gaming's play-by-post roleplay server. Pretty sure I mentioned it on the podcast a couple of times over the past few months how I have really gotten into the play-by-post community because my life is a little bit too hectic for me to sit down and play D&D for an extended period of time around a table or in front of a camera. Although uh, we are going to be making some time for some new role-playing games in the future. 
it is much more convenient for me to be able to log in whenever I have a few minutes, make a couple of posts, do a couple of roles, have a combat here and there. So I have taken what I have learned from spending about, I want to say, 10 months in the Play by Post community in a very active server. And Rob, as well as a couple other members from our community, have helped me to make our own server. And we've been having a lot of fun getting that off the ground. Kind of slow rolled it at the beginning, but I think we're getting close to the point where we're ready to grow. So if that is something you're interested in, we will give some details later on about how you can get involved in that as well. Other than that, I have also been trying to build a playground in the backyard for my kids. Uh, So it has been a a very busy couple of weeks for me as well, even though I've been home the whole time. Yeah, I I do not envy that. I I ran out there and helped you all with uh, a little bit of the playground work for a while and just exhausted myself and... I, I won the good uncle points for showing up, and now now I just pity you guys <laughs> no, when you're out there. Yeah, uh, you helped us dig holes. Digging holes is by far the worst part. But enough about fun things we've done and manual labor. Let's talk D&D. That's what this podcast is about. All right, well, as Steve said, we're going to kick things off with the reworked Epic Boons. The reaction to the Epic Boons that were presented in previous Unearthed Arcana and playtest material for 1D&D were met with about the same reactions that we met them with. These are not, or rather were not, great capstone abilities for a character who has survived and put in the effort to reach 20th level. So, they went back and reworked the three that appeared in the Cleric Unearthed Arcana. The Epic Boon of Fate, the Epic Boon of Spell Recall, and the Epic Boon of True Sight now have new versions here in this playtest. Let's start things off with the first one. They give us the Epic Boon of Fate. This one is available to mages and priests. The first part of the feat says that you're going to be able to increase one of your mental ability scores, that's intelligence, wisdom, or charisma, by 1 to a maximum of 30, which breaks the previously existing limit that said that you could not raise them above 20. This is in addition to the ability score increases that you gain at level 20, which can also do the same. On top of all of that, you also get a new ability called Improve Fate. Improve Fate states that when another creature within 60 feet of you fails a d20 test, you can add or subtract 2d4 from that roll. When you take this boon, you start with 8 uses, and you can use those whenever you want as long as you use them no more than once per turn. You regain 2d4 expended uses anytime you take a long rest. This is pretty good. There's, there's very few things you get to use so often throughout the course of an adventuring day. Most feats are saying you can do this little thing all the time, or you can do this big thing maybe once, maybe twice. This is giving you up to 8 uses of something. When we're coming from this feat previously giving you the ability to do the same thing with 1d10 once per short rest, this has a lot more flexibility. Right, this feels a little bit more like a a magic wand or something like that. This is an ability that has charges, which is fairly unique in 5e. Uh, I'm sure there's maybe one or two others that do that, but I can't think of them off the top of my head. This might be one of the first. Normally, this is kind of a, a magic item thing, regaining and expending charges. So it's a familiar mechanic, it's just not usually given to a character or attached to a feat. Right, and I think this is a little bit of an improvement from the previous iteration of this feat that we currently have in 5e, which states that you get to use that 1d10, now you get to use 2d4. Even though the maximum is lowered, your minimum roll and your average roll have both increased significantly. Something that I know you mentioned earlier that is kind of just odd about this feat is that you can use this 2d4 and apply it as a bonus or a penalty to the role of another creature. What's funny is that is worded the exact same way as it was in 5th edition, except that in 5th edition you could use this ability to add that bonus or penalty whenever they made a roll. However, in 1d&D you can only use it when they fail a roll, Which begs the question, why would you want to add an additional penalty to the role of another creature who has already failed a saving throw? Right. I mean, as as it is currently written, in in a way that is extremely confusing to me, you can only use this feat when someone else, not yourself, when someone else nearby fails something. And if they've failed, why would you want to add insult to injury? There's no mechanic for double failing or for, (laughs) like, failing hard in this game. You can't turn a fail into a critical fail. Right. I mean, there are RPGs out there that you have different levels of success 
or where the amount that you miss the target number by matters. But outside of some instant petrification on a Medusa and a few other very niche examples, how much you fail by doesn't matter. So unless they're planning on introducing a mechanic like that, this does not make sense. Right, because it's obvious that if one of your allies fails a d20 test, you would want to add your rolls to them as a bonus to maybe help them succeed. But the only time you would want someone to fail a saving throw is if it is an enemy. And they're succeeding. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So I think that maybe this was an oversight. Maybe this was something that they wrote in and then forgot to go back and change. I hope that it is. If not, maybe they're future-proofing in some way that I do not understand because a fail is a fail is a fail. I just just don't really get that. That's odd. But I think it's a pretty decent feat either way. I would probably take this one over both of the ones that we're about to cover, although I think you might disagree. If it weren't for that caveat of only being able to use it upon a fail, this might be my favorite. Because being able to toy with fate in both directions in a meaningful way would be huge. As it stands, it's still good. It just does half of what it's good for. Well, and you get to do it a lot of times. Yeah, that, and that that covers up a lot. Definitely a step in the right direction. Definitely a more appealing option than the pre-existing versions of this. But let's go over to the Epic Boon of Spell Recall. This is the second of the three that we're going to be covering. It also allows you to increase your mental ability scores by 1 to a max of 30 and is also exclusive to the Mage and Priest groups. This boon gives you the opportunity when you cast a spell of first to fourth level to roll a d4, and if it matches that spell's level, you don't spend the spell slot. For those of you who agreed with Rob and were excited about how the epic boon of fate was a good move in the right direction and a feat that felt powerful for a 20th level character's capstone ability, we're sorry that that part of the conversation is over. (laughs) Okay, this ability gives you a 25% chance of casting your lowest level spells for free. While it is technically still good, the odds that it's going to do anything for you are pretty low, and when it does, it's not going to be majorly impactful. By this level, wizards can get spells back with arcane recovery, sorcerers can get spells back with font of magic, warlocks can get their spells back by taking a quick nap. You may have pearls of power or rings of spell storing to be able to store spells for later use. Priests can get spells back using their channel divinity, of which they have many, many more now. So getting the opportunity to get these spells back in just another way doesn't seem very fun. I mean, for one, there's a low odds of it happening. For two, even when it happens, you're like, oh, okay, I guess I just don't check that box right now. (laughs) Doesn't really make your character more powerful. It might be okay in a game that's a lot about uh, endurance or like a survival sort of thing. It's like a, if it's like a grindy game. Yeah. If you're trying to outlast your DM in a war of attrition, which I'll I'll go ahead and be honest with you, they're always going to win because they decide when it starts and when it ends. Mm. That would be the only sort of situation where I could see this coming in handy. And even then, it doesn't feel like a 20th level feature. I would love, love the opportunity to get back some of my higher level spell slots with these kind of odds. But the lower level spell slots that I'm using for shield and fly and haste, you've already got a couple of them by this point, and you've already got ways to get them back. It's just not that appealing for me. Yeah, you know, if if they had said when you cast a spell of 6th level or lower, roll a d4, and on a result of 4, you don't spend the spell slot. How would that sound? It would sound better. I still don't know that I would take it because some of these epic boons are really good, but at least then it would be part of the conversation. You know, there's there might be a build or a game where that would work, whereas I don't know if there's a build or a game that this would fit into, not when you're presented with almost any other epic boon option. I, I, I believe I agree. When we're talking about a grittier, grindier game, this ability to possibly renew a resource is fun, and I, I like rolling dice. I like having a chance to do something cool, and I like the elation of that gamble. I agree, first to fourth level, not very exciting as spell slots go when you are able to cast ninth level spells at this stage. But also something that occurred to me is this feat requires you to cast a spell, 
If spells fuel class features for you, for instance, the Paladin Smite, this boon will not help you anyway. If you're spending spell slots on things that aren't spells, this boon doesn't have your back. And you know, maybe maybe that's the niche, right? Like, maybe this is for Paladins, because they have so few spell slots, most of which are going to be in this level. So there's a chance that a Paladin is going to cast one of its you know, fourth level spell slots, and then get to keep that in order to smite with it. The Paladin, I think, has the best argument for taking this feature. However, the design philosophy of epic boons in 1D&D is that they need to be more epic than their 5E counterparts. And I would take most 5E epic boons over this one to say nothing of the other 1D&D options. They can add this to their 2014 PHB, but quite honestly, I think it'd be a waste of paper just because I don't see people taking this one. That is a fair point, though. I'm, I'm mostly thinking, even though we're here in the Priest UA, I'm mostly thinking of spellcasters, mages, taking this feat and how it would not be great for them. For a paladin, this is pretty much every spell slot you spend. Uh, and ditto for the Warlock, which we haven't seen yet. If you only get a couple of spells as a Warlock and you have a 25% chance of getting that spell again, this may look a lot more appealing. Rob, they just released a video today talking about the new 1 D&D Warlocks, and they are going to get full spellcasting. Ooh. Packed magic is gone. I would say... I'm probably going to like the Warlock more than I did in 5e then. I think that's going to be the case. I was listening to the announcement video when I was in the break room at lunch today. I still haven't read the release. This is, by the way, for anyone who wonders when we're recording these things, this is the day that the next playtest packet, after the one we were discussing, was released. And I was jumping up and down in my break room when they were talking about the mage classes. I think that some of those are going to be my new favorites. They're going to be really fun to discuss. Unfortunately, we don't get to talk about them at just this exact point in time. Uh, However, I would say Warlocks will get the same amount of benefit from this as Paladins because they're effectively going to be a half-caster. Can't wait to see how they continue to make the Hexblade Warlock a screaming disappointment. (laughs) Not that the Hexblade Warlock is bad. What do you mean a screaming disappointment? From a theme perspective? No, it it is disappointing because it is the only good Warlock. If you're not playing a Hexblade (laughs) Warlock... You must not have read it correctly. They're pretty excited about the subclass that they've given us. I guess we'll find out after we record this, when we finally crack open that PDF, exactly how excited we should be about it. Well, since we're excited to read that PDF, maybe we should get through this then. There's one more epic boon for us to go through. It is the epic boon of True Sight. Not available to the mage group this time. Priests only, please. Still benefits one of your mental ability scores and gives you True Sight out to 60 feet. Now we talked a little bit about true sight when we were talking about the rangers and the different forms of vision. True sight is it's the one you want and you finally have it out to the extent of a normal dark vision range, being able to see through illusions, being able to see through into the ethereal plane, nothing is hiding from you. If your campaign or your character pushes you towards this, there's no way you're not taking it. But if it doesn't, you are probably scrolling past it pretty quickly. True Sight is one of those abilities that is as important as your DM makes it. I know that I complained once about the Dungeon Delver feat because it gave you better odds of escaping the damage from traps and finding secret doors. However, you as a player have absolutely no control over how many traps and secret doors you encounter. It is simply a feat that you take to keep your DM from getting one over on you. I feel like it's the same thing with True Sight. Invisible enemies and ethereal plane enemies or creatures or secrets aren't going to come up at every table, but when they do, this is a feature that you can take to make sure that your DM does not put you at a disadvantage. But unlike the Dungeon Delver feat, I feel like this one isn't bad because True Sight is topping the charts of all of the senses in D&D. There is no mechanical way to get around it, which is why it is always kept from player characters so that dungeon masters can find a loophole to surprise them in some way. And this is basically, sorry DM, you can't do that, the feat. (laughs) So there's a note here at the bottom of this paragraph that says that we agree, as the designers of Dungeons & Dragons, that epic boons could use a little more pizzazz. (laughs) A little more razzle-dazzle. Well, 
the only pizzazz that has been added to the Epic Boon of True Sight is that it gets that ability score increase. Otherwise, it is the same as we've seen it in every iteration before, so I really hope you wanted that plus one to a mental ability score. I feel like this one is, is fine. There is no way that currently exists, to the best of my knowledge, to get around True Sight. It is the most perceptive your character can be without rolling dice. So the promise has been made that they were going to go back to the other epic boons we've seen in previous playtest documents and give them this treatment and buff them up a little bit and add ability score improvements to all of them. That will help. I think that was needed for most of them. If you go back and listen to previous episodes, there were a few that we were really excited about. But for the most part, yeah, it's good that they're going back and tuning them up. And they're not all going to be equal. There's still going to be ones that are better than others and ones that we are more excited about and ones that Steve likes and ones that I like. But I think it is fairly universally accepted that something needed to be done and something is being done. And that's good to hear. I think that about does it for the epic boons. Let's move on to the spells that have been updated in this playtest material. First off, we come to the Smite spells. These are the iconic Paladin-only spells. Well, mostly Paladin-only spells that allowed you to not only do extra damage with your Smite, but also, and even simultaneously, have a spell precast to do even more damage and apply a debilitating effect on the enemy. All of these spells have been improved strictly in multiple ways. Some in this way, some in that way, but there are a couple of changes that have been made unilaterally. The first of which is the fact that now, rather than using a bonus action to cast them and then having to maintain concentration on that spell until you hit a creature, now all of them can be applied on hit as long as you haven't yet expended your bonus action. That means that some of these will never require concentration at all, and the ones that do will only require concentration after they've been successfully applied. So whatever whatever effect they generate, just maintaining that effect for a certain duration. Exactly, meaning that there's no chance of you wasting the spell slot by casting it, making an attack that misses and then getting your lights knocked out by a monster and having your concentration drop before the effect was ever applied. And when you get so few spell slots as a paladin, that is a case of the feel bads. (laughs) Wasting a spell as well, (laughs) insult to injury, not only did I get my concentration broken, not only did I get punched out and take some damage, but that was one of my few spell slots that's now gone. And that was a reason to cast the Divine Smites as opposed to using the spells in 5e. Is Divine Smites applied on hit, spells typically didn't. So this is bringing those back into a conversation that they were kept out of before. In 5th edition, that was a very crucial decision because you had to decide which way you were going to spend your spell slots. However, in 5th edition, you could actually apply a Divine Smite and a Smite spell simultaneously. However, in the 1 D&D playtest material we have here, that is not an option because you can't smite on the turn that you cast a spell and vice versa. So now the two are forever separated unless they make a change to that ruling, which is possibly the change that I think that needs to happen to the Paladins most. Either that or the fact that now the Divine Smite is not added to the damage of the attack meaning that if you roll a critical on the attack, you're only doubling the weapon damage instead of the Divine Smite damage. Uh, Those would be my two requests, Wizards of the Coast, if you listen to this podcast. In addition to reading all the other feedback, maybe if you listen to this podcast, you you can just do that one for me, please. Another way that these have been changed is they have all been given provision for unarmed strikes. We were talking about how the Paladin's class features kind of leave the unarmed strike and ranged options behind a little bit as we continue. Here, no matter what you hit the target with, you can smite. Fist, arrow, crossbow bolt, table leg, or traditional weapon, you're good to go. Or bullet, because who doesn't like having guns in their games? Mm. (laughs) No one I know. Mm. Uh, Finally, the last improvement that have been made to all the Divine Smite spells is that they are all now upcastable. That means that all of their damage will now scale if you are able to cast it at a level higher than it is currently set. Which, now that I'm thinking about it, that's, that's not actually the final change, because kind of an incidental change is that all of these spells are now available to anyone who can use the Divine Spell List. Which only comes to mind, really, at the moment, because I noticed that Banishing Smite is upcastable. 
but paladins never get above 5th level spell slots, meaning that they'll never be able to cast a 6th level Banishing Smite unless they multiclass. That's right, and you know, we talked about the paladin for the last couple of episodes, and we're probably going to be talking about them again, but take everything that we're about to say about these Smite spells and remember back to when we were talking about the Cleric. The Cleric is going to have more battlefield utility, that is to say, more damage output in combat, thanks to the ability to take these spells. A Smiting Cleric is going to be a whole new look for that class. And with access to spell slots beyond what the Paladin is going to have access to, they're going to be able to smite better than Paladins. I want you to keep that in mind, because I really want to talk about that right now, but I'm going to wait... I'm going to wait until we get to the end of this section. Let's let's talk about the spells a little bit, and then I'll come back to that. The first spell that we have on our list is actually the strongest one from a starting spell level perspective, the aforementioned Banishing Smite. It triggers the same way as all the other ones do. You successfully hit another creature with a weapon or unarmed strike. When that happens, the target's going to take an extra 5d10 damage and be subjected to make a charisma saving throw. If they fail it, they're going to be incapacitated and shunted to a harmless demiplane where they're going to spend the next minute trying to repeat that saving throw in order to end this effect on a success. If the spell lasts for the full minute and they fail their saving throws for the entire time, if the target is an aberration, celestial, elemental, fey, or fiend, instead of coming back to the plane that you are on, they are instead transported to a random location on a plane associated with their creature type. Elementals would go to elemental planes, fey would go to the fey wild, fiends would go to one of the infernal planes, etc., etc. You get the idea. So let's take that and compare it to the old version of the spell that we're currently playing with in 5th edition. 5e made this harder to use effectively. It didn't have a saving throw associated with it. Instead, it had a current hit point minimum. If after the attack, the target of your attack had less than 50 hit points remaining, then it was transported to a harmless demiplane. It had to be weakened before this would be useful, or it had to be weak in the first place. Tying this to a saving throw makes this more useful. That means every time you're casting a 5th level spell, it has a chance to do something. In 5th edition, you kind of had to have a peek behind the screen, or had to ask your dungeon master, okay, does it look really hurt yet? Okay, does it look really hurt yet? And, I don't know, by the time something's down to 50 hit points or fewer, are you really worried about banishing it? Why not just kill the thing? Beyond that, the spell states that if the target is not native to the plane of existence that you are on, when it is shunted out of your plane, it goes to its home plane. But that had nothing to do with creature type. And oftentimes, the player playing the game wouldn't know, well, this is a demon, but is it from here? Or, this is a person, but is it from the Feywild? And it kind of put things in the Dungeon Master's hands, and I imagine many tables where there was some player frustration, or where there were loopholes that could be used. Here, it is quite clear how the spell works, how it will be employed, and how it will be ruled at the table. Banishing Smite is very similar to the rework of Banishment that we were given during the Cleric UA. One of the major changes from their 5e counterparts is that in 5th edition, the target did not make a saving throw at the end of each of its turns. That is one D&D exclusive. So in 5th edition, if the creature failed at saving throw when you cast Banishment, then unless you got the concentration knocked out of you, it was going to stay there the whole time. That was one of my least favorite things about that spell in 5th edition, and it was one of my least favorite spells in 5th edition, is that someone could just force a creature to make a single saving throw versus a 5th level spell, and any creature that didn't have a legendary resistance could be gone from the fight with just a single saving throw. Even if they were at full health, there wasn't even a saving throw. It was automatic. As long as the casters could maintain that concentration, those creatures were gone. So as a person who runs games, as a DM, the DM in me really likes that this feature is there. But that does also make the spells a good bit weaker, which I usually don't like. So I like the trade-off of giving the DM a chance to get their monster back, but not requiring the player's concentration. I think that these are both perfectly reworked for 1D&D. I argue this is how they should have been before. 
And you know what? Hey, even if they uh, succeed on their saving throw, even at first, you still do, did 5d10 damage. So Right. One of the things that I am going to contend, personally, is that these spells are out-and-out -out improvements not just over their 5e counterparts, but they're also improvements over Divine Smite. Personally, as someone who really enjoys playing Paladins, I don't see myself using Divine Smite when I have any of these other spells on the table, which is another problem <laughs> <laughs> with how I perceive Paladins in this playtest material. Like I mentioned before, it's been several weeks since we recorded the Paladin episode, and in that time, I realized that when I was sitting here talking to Rob about them, I had on rose-colored glasses, and I was really excited about how cool Abjure Foes was, and I was really excited about how cool... You were seeing things through my eye. <laughs> my excitement for the Paladin nerf rubbed off on you. I was real excited for uh, how they were handling the auras and how efficient everything was, but what I didn't realize is the core thing that makes a Paladin a Paladin for me being Divine Smile was effectively taken away. And while it is still technically there, you have almost no reason to use it now. And again, I'm going to cover this in a little bit. They actually took what was special about you and gave it to someone else. Don't cover it in a little bit. You just said so much, we don't need to go back to it again. So finish saying <laughs> what else you want to say now, and then let us move on. Clerics in 1D&D &D are Paladin Plus. Because Divine Smite is now worse than these Smite spells, and because these Smite spells cannot compound with Smite, you can't do them both on the same turn anymore, and because Clerics can cast these Smite spells at higher levels than Paladins, and they can get them at those higher levels faster than Paladins, there is absolutely nothing special left about Divine Smite, period, end of conversation. They even took away the... But damage bonus on fiends. They even took away the damage bonus on fiends. Okay, you know what? That little question, you know, is it a fiend or an undead or something like that? It used to be that there were certain creature types that made your regular divine smite better than one of these. And if you had to choose between them, there were going to be certain instances where casting one of those was going to be preferable to this. And even that doesn't exist anymore. Even that marginal bonus against fairly common creature types, the two most common creature types, I believe, is, is gone now. There is no reason other than their aura to play a paladin anymore. And they took that paladin aura that you used to get at 7th level and moved it to 10th level. And they didn't really improve the aura from a mechanical perspective. The changes they made to it were fairly nominal. Like, you get a little bit of something here and you take a little bit of something here and it ends up working pretty much the same as it used to. But you get it later. And while it was a core paladin feature before it is now the only core paladin feature in every other way at any point in their level progression a cleric will be a better paladin than a paladin will it even the freaking i'm gonna keep going because you told me I, this was the time for me to do it even we're at the fine 45 minutes spell. in ladies and gentlemen we've made it through four things <laughs> you told me to do this now it's not my fault i was gonna say this for the end you already started don't blame this on me even the find steed spell that used to be paladin only is now on the divine spell list and therefore able to be picked up by clerics paladins can now cast it as an action and they get one casting of it for free at its lowest level because yes as we covered in one of our little record scratch moments whenever you get to cast a spell for free it is at its lowest level meaning that a cleric is going to get access to find steed faster than a paladin a cleric is going to be able to cast it at a higher level than a paladin will ever get to faster than a paladin will be able to cast it at their max level but it's my little pony steven <laughs> that pony is mine and our friendship is magic it's the cleric's little pony now Paladins, they're my favorite class in 5th edition. I have no reason to play in 1D&D anymore. As cool as the little toys and bells and whistles that they gave them are, at the end of the day, if you love Paladins in 5th edition, you're going to end up playing a Cleric in 1D&D. &D. And that's sadly just the way it is. You can still play a Paladin, but the guy next to you being a Cleric is going to be a better Paladin than you. I'm sorry. Can I, can I finish 
Banishing Smite now? <laughs> yes, yes, we could go back and finish if, Banishing if Smite. If you are a cleric and you get access to 6th level spells and beyond, you add an extra d10 of damage when you use that spell slot to cast the spell. All right, we made it through four things, guys. <laughs> We're doing great. If anyone was wondering why I was griefing about <laughs> that, that's why. It's because a paladin, a straight class paladin at level 20 will never get the ability to upcast that spell. Is going to get to do it at level 11 and something a 20th level paladin can't do. I think they got the message. Okay, let's talk about the next spell on our list. Here, I'll, I'll let me take over. I think you wore yourself out talking. <laughs> to, no, go, go no, put your soapbox back in the drawer, and I <laughs> will carry on. Next up is Blinding Smite. Other than the fact that it no longer requires concentration and can be applied in more ways with more methods of delivery, it is the same. You can upcast it, as Steve said. Once again, and this is going to be true for all of them, when we say that these smites can be upcast, you spend a higher level spell slot and you get one bonus damage die of whatever the spell is normally dealing. That's it. That's Blinding Smite. Otherwise, it's as you remembered it. If you loved it, you still love it. If you didn't, too bad. Skipping down a couple of pages, for those of you who are following along, we come to Glimmering Smite. Now, Glimmering Smite did exist in 5th edition. In a way, it was called Branding Smite then. This is one of the ones that does still require your concentration. After you hit a creature with an attack, you can use your bonus action to cast this ability. The target's going to take 2d6 extra radiant damage, and if it was invisible, it becomes no longer invisible. In addition, it becomes real shiny! It sheds bright light in a five-foot radius, and attack rolls against it now have advantage. All right, so here's the thing. Love this. I love player characters having a way to take something that is invisible and making it visible again. It's a great trick. It's why Fairy Fire exists. And Fairy Fire has a deck save on it, so even then, the, the sneaky things are probably still going to continue sneaking. But if you have to hit an invisible thing to make it visible... That, that's hard. You have disadvantage <laughs> to hit things that are invisible. Even if you know where they are, if you have them cornered, you're still going to be having difficulty hitting it. But whether or not it's invisible, you're giving advantage to other people trying to hit the same target until the spell ends. That much is good. That It's getting the bonus exciting bit of Guiding Bolt and putting it on something for longer. It's not just the next attack roll. It's the next minute of attack rolls as long as you maintain your concentration on the spell. You know what's weird about this is in 5th edition, it didn't say that the target shed bright light in a 5-foot radius and attack rolls against it have advantage. So this version is empirically more powerful. However, what it did say in 5th edition is that the target can no longer become invisible. And I think it's odd that that is missing here because even though you will know where the target is thanks to the light that it is shedding, it technically can still become invisible and give you disadvantage on tax against it again. Because invisibility is a condition, you know, that, that it applies to itself as opposed to just a state of not being seen. It's ending the condition and the condition could be theoretically reapplied. I think in the narrative of it, I think in the direction they were hoping that we would read it, it's still going to be shiny either way. Even if it tries to become visible again, maybe you know where it's at. They did leave us some wiggle room. I don't like it when they leave us wiggle room. If they're going to take the time to actually write down a rule, then let's make it clear and know exactly what it does. If it doesn't matter to you, don't write down the rule and leave it up to the DM and the table. So yeah, I, w I would appreciate that one being cleaned up a little bit. Now, that being said, if they were to apply the invisible condition to themselves again, it doesn't mean that you would get disadvantage on your attacks against them anymore. What it means is that the disadvantage imposed by the invisible condition would now cancel out the advantage that you have thanks to Glimmering Smite, turning everything back into basic, unmodified rolls. Which is kind of an incentive for them to try to become invisible again, and then try to knock the Glimmering Smite out of you. Which I think is actually one of my new favorite phrases now that I say it. If I'm going I'm to knock the glimmering smite out of you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next up, Searing Smite. This is one of the first smites that you will have access to when you enter the priest class group. That's right, because it's one of the first level ones. I, I, I thought that was implied. <laughs> you will get access to this at the same level that you will get access to Divine Smite. Clerics will have been enjoying it sooner. <laughs> <laughs> and while this one does less damage than Divine Smite, it has the potential to do more, meaning that this question of do I Divine Smite or do I cast a spell is going to be a pretty impactful one. 
Granted, all of these spells do require your bonus action, which Divine Smite does not. But if you've got that bonus action available, I'd probably use Searing Smite on the chance to get its effect every time. Speaking of that effect, it's pretty much what you remember. You're going to light something on fire, it's going to take an extra d6 fire damage, and it's going to keep taking that damage every turn until it passes a con save. Now the interesting thing here is they make the distinction that now it is magical fire, which is, I believe, important. There are plenty of spell effects in the game that can douse normal run-of-the-mill standard fire that will now not apply to this. Maybe you can't just walk up to somebody and use an action to put it out. Yeah, jumping in the lake does not stop Searing Smite anymore. As long as they keep failing their saving throws, they're going to continue to take that 1d6 fire damage at the end of each of their turns, meaning that it could quickly outpace a traditional Divine Smite as long as you don't get the concentration knocked out of you. After that, we skip on down to Staggering Smite. Staggering Smite is a fourth level option that states when you hit a creature, they take an extra 4d6 psychic damage as the strike pierces both body and mind. Okay, that's, that's just some weird flavor text, but you know, there you go. That's what it does. And the target must succeed on a wisdom saving throw or become stunned until the end of your next turn. Stunned, guys. That is a pretty good thing to have. Notice that it does not say until the end of its next turn. It says until the end of your next turn. So when you cast a spell, you will get a chance to take advantage of it, almost guaranteed. This is the monk's stunning strike, but the smite, plus damage. So even though there's no reason to be a paladin because you could be a cleric, there's no reason to be a monk because you could be a paladin who could be a cleric. So now clerics are just monks. Clerics are better paladins and monks. Look, we know nothing. <laughs> Even with the new UA that's come out today, we know nothing about monks. They're going to kick ass in one D&D. You just wait. You know what? I bet they will. This is their chance to fix monks and make Steve excited to play them. I dare I say that their chance to make monks decent. The monks stunning strike is their central feature, if you ask me. And I feel like because they gave that to the monk, they were afraid to give them anything else. And so here's their chance to tweak that and to give them all the things that we want monks to have. You know, if you look at, you know, media, like they should be able to do like the Kung Fu Wushu anime stuff. Like give them the ability to like freaking teleport no, around no, the battlefield. No, you know, we don't need Goku. We don't need Goku in my DD. Give them the ability to walk upside down like Naruto or, you know, give them the ability to Naruto run or something. I don't know. Something like that. Who cares? Um, they're going to have to go a long way to make me want to play monks in this game, but this is their opportunity to do it, and I really expect them to. They're giving so many classes the tweaks that they needed. Paladin wasn't one of them, but I am very much expecting them to take some good steps with the monks when we get around to them. But in the meantime, until they show us that stuff, Staggering Smite by itself is better than monks. And it's way better than the old version where they had disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks and lost their reactions. Stun puts a bullet in your clip for being able to hurt them more yourself and have your party be placed in the same position. Good for you and bad for them, both at the same time, which is an out-and-out -out improvement over how it used to work. Following the trend of Searing Smite, we have thunderous smite and by following the trend i mean basically the same you can apply it in new ways now it doesn't require concentration and you can upcast it in the traditional way so thunderous strike is the first one we come to that has had really no other changes at all other than the standard improvements to smites about how they are applied and how you can upcast them this is exactly the same it was fine and it remains fine honestly i like this one a little bit better than searing smite so uh yeah, pretty fine. I, I would say, like, fine plus. Speaking of fine, Wrathful Smite. Once again, looking pretty familiar to 5e. Now, though, when you strike a target and they take some psychic damage and make a wisdom save versus the frightened condition, they can try to get out of it at the end of each of their turns. That was not a thing in 5th edition, because in 5e, they were allowed to spend their action to make a wisdom check, not saving throw... If they miss the saving throw the first time, then they're down to a check. Maybe they had proficiency in wisdom saving throws, now they don't. It is harder for them to get out of the condition that you inflict upon them. This new version is worse than that, because they get to make the check for free, and they get to keep making saving throws at the end of each of their turns. But in a way, I kind of like that better. It follows kind of what you expect, kind of how I imagine a lot of Dungeon Masters were running this anyway, because they didn't read 5th edition's very niche effect on this spell compared to how basically every other mechanic in the game works. Yeah, that's weird that I didn't realize that the previous version of Wrathful Smite 
self-perpetuated. It gave you disadvantage on the thing that you needed to do to end it. Yeah, and that's a first level spell. Yeah, this was the king, I think, of all of the smites in 5th edition. But now, oh how the mighty have fallen. In 1 D&D, it doesn't do a lot of extra damage. It does the same base damage as Searing Smite, which is the lowest of all the smite spells. The target gets to make saving throws at the end of each of its turns. It doesn't self-perpetuate like it did in 5e, and you have to maintain concentration on it. This is the only one that I feel like really took a step back. I would rather something die than run away from me any day when it comes to a combat in D&D. Just because it's more satisfying that way? No, because then it's not a problem later. Ah, true, true. You know, I think that I would have left it the way that it was, probably. You know, I've, of course, made the changes to how it's activated and the fact that you can upcast it. Uh, And I probably would have changed it from a wisdom check to a wisdom saving throw that it got to make. But I like the fact that in 5th edition, in order to get out of this effect, it had to use its action at least once in order to make that saving throw again. This Wrathful Smite could cost them nothing. For that reason, I think that I'm extremely unlikely to use it. I hope that they change this one back and give it a a little bit of retooling in some way, shape, or form to get that back. Granted, you know, maybe something that costs another enemy an action is a little bit much for a first level spell, but at least it cost them something. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. If it's going to hurt me more and make me frightened and take my action, it better take more than a first level spell slot out of you. So maybe we move this one up to second level and give it some of its old functionality back. Right now, the only second level smite is Glimmering Smite. Well, that does it for the smites. We're going to scroll on down a couple of pages and get into the rules glossary. This is a lot of the same and some of the different. We're just going to try and hit the highlights as we go down. And we're going to start with dying. (laughs) A very good place to start. (laughs) We're going to start dying. We'll go through this one quickly because this one is not rocket science. You still get to dying the same way that you get to dying in 5th edition. You run out of hit points. You get out of it the same way that you would get out of it in 5th edition. When the condition ends on you, you reset the number of successes and failures that you had from rolling your death saving throws. The difference now is that when you stabilize, when you roll three successes, you regain a hit point, but remain unconscious. You're not sitting at zero. You're sitting at one. You're okay. You're just asleep for a little while. Timmy's feeling tired now. (laughs) Your buddies can still come up and heal you and pick you up after that point. They can still come and perform a medicine check to perform first aid and pick you up from one hit point and unconscious to one hit point and conscious. But that is basically the only change. And in a way, I think that is a good change. Having a hit point and having a new condition, which we'll talk about in a minute, of being fine, just knocked out, is something that D&D could have used before now. Maybe I should say having it as a defined condition is a good thing. Because now you can have different spells and different game mechanics that can interact with that condition specifically. This, I feel like I'm more confused by the new dying mechanic than I was by the old dying mechanic. I'm glad that unconscious is a condition because it's something that we can get applied to us in different ways. But I also feel like it took a fairly simple concept and made it very, very wordy. (laughs) I feel like this is... Not very different from the way things were set up in 5th edition. And it is probably more clear, but it is very much, to me, not more concise. Like, I think I would have a little bit more trouble explaining the new dying condition to someone than I would have had explaining the old dying condition to them. I guess dying wasn't a condition then, and that was, that's the thing that they're trying to clear up. The dying status of 5th edition versus the dying condition of 1 D&D. I like the fact that it's a condition. I I guess that's just something I I just got to get over it. I got to stare at it until I think I can explain it more concisely, which is weird because, again, it, it hasn't really changed very much. Well, let's move to something with a much more clearly defined change then. It's not a big change. It's a good change, but it is a change. Fly speed in 1 D&D is going to work slightly differently than it did in 5th edition because while being knocked prone or having your speed reduced to zero will cause you to plummet in 5th edition, now the incapacitated condition will have the same effect in 1 D&D. And that makes... That makes pretty good sense. Being incapacitated means that you can't really do anything that you want to do, such as flap your little birdie wings or focus well enough in order to be able to keep yourself aloft 
as say on the fly spell the weird bit is incapacitated doesn't actually affect your movement speed if you're on the ground but if you're flying i guess it involves more locomotion <laughs> than standing up does because you are going to start hitting the ground. Pretty much what you said, I think that is a good decision. I'm just surprised that your ability to stand and your ability to fly are... Are separate. Not similar. Yeah. I mean, granted, flying is probably harder than standing, so that makes sense. It's true, because I'm great at standing. Granted, I'm generally confused that the incapacitated condition doesn't affect your movement, because I really feel like it should, you know, just based on the, the word. Otherwise, it would be, like, hampered or hindered. But no, in incapacitated, I generally think of as being able to do nothing. Moderately inconvenienced. All right, moving on from the fly speed. The next thing that we see the significant changes on is the grappled condition. This one got a good bit of changes, and it makes me... Uh, it, it makes me not want to talk about it, because I don't think this is the final version either. <laughs> and we're just wasting our time talking about all their... Their ideas, man. They're just throwing it at the wall and see what sticks. Yeah, this darn A-B testing that they're doing, like, they should just figure out if they're going to give us A or B, A. <laughs> uh, I kind of like the older version of this better, so let's talk about what they've taken away. The first thing that we notice is under the movable section of the grappled condition, they took away slowed condition. Like, the grappled condition used to apply the slowed condition. Which is no longer a thing at all. I liked the slowed condition. I felt like it was pretty good. Yeah, we, we both like slowed. You liked it more than me, but it was a good thing. I like having more conditions. I like there being more things to fix, more things to hinder, more things that are very specific so that you can apply exactly the effect that is correct for the situation. The fewer of those you have, the, just the more rules you have, honestly. I mean, because the conditions were kind of a catch-all. Like, lots of things could point to this. Now you got to have a rule for individual things. Right, and I, I really don't like the expression, every foot of movement costs one extra foot. That is just needlessly verbose and more complicated than it needs to be. I'm sure maybe there's a reason they say it that way instead of your speed is halved or moving while grappled costs twice the movement. I feel like all of those things would make more sense. And if they had an additional impact on the game, it would be minimal. Moving while grappled through difficult terrain would cost you, if you say that both of those doubled it, you know, moving one foot would now cost you four feet instead of three feet. And I mean, yeah, that's a difference, you know, if if you did it that way. But I don't feel like it's going to really get you much further on your turn. And I, I just like the simplicity of saying double it or have it rather than putting it like this. Especially when you're encouraging us to play on a grid where moving one space costs five feet. You know, if you if you had it broken down more incrementally than saying, I'd like to go one extra foot, but I don't have two extra feet of movement. No, it's, it's I want to move five extra feet, but I don't have ten extra feet of movement is, is different. Look, I mean, I know that D&D &D is just fantasy battle math, but I mean, come on, guys. Let's let's just use multiplication. I want to play that RPG. The... Let's you make already, a game called Fantasy You already math. play that RPG. That's what I'm saying. No, but let's call it that. Every RPG is that, just to varying degrees. The other difference in the grappled condition is how you get out. We experimented in a previous UA of it being a saving throw. I kind of liked that. Strength saving throws don't get enough love. Uh, now we're back to athletics and acrobatics checks to get out of the condition. Don't like it. It was better. You nailed it. You got it in one. The very first playtest material, you fixed the grappled condition and the unarmed strikes. Leave them alone. And you fluffed it up. We already said it was good. You flumped it. You flumped it right up. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. Let's do that in the future episodes. Let's just say flump. Oh, yeah, we can. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. What the flump? It also clarifies that, and, and this one I do like, if the distance between you and the grappler exceeds the grappler's range, you are freed from the grapple. I do like that caveat. So it's not all forced movement anymore, right? Yeah, it doesn't say if something removes you from the grappler's range. And defining that generating distance in any way will remove you from the grapple. Okay, the, the thing that I do like about that is that like your ally with the telekinetic feet can't just give you a little tug and pop you out of the giant's hands. So I like that that is no longer an option because that doesn't make thematic sense. But the way that it is phrased right now does mean that if you use Misty Step, to move 10 feet, you could still be in that giant's hand. 
his hand would teleport with you to that new place within 10 feet of itself. Yeah. I, I don't like that. So whereas I can see why they made a change. Well, just don't teleport within his reach. You're <laughs> teleporting. You can go elsewhere. I mean, you know, maybe you're trying to take advantage of, like, flanking rules with one of your allies who's doing that sort of thing. Or maybe Boo. you are uh, trying to get to the magic item that he's protecting or something like that. Maybe you don't want to be that far away from him. Maybe you have melee attacks and you just want to be, you know, right up in his face again. Uh, or maybe you want to grab something and run away. But for the same reasons, I, I see why they did it, because it makes some things make more thematic sense, like the more mundane things. It also makes the magical things, of which there are a bunch in D&D, it makes them make less sense under certain situations. So I'm kind of neither here nor there on this. I, I think it's good in some ways, bad in others. Don't necessarily see why it necessitated the change. Well, I mean, hey, if you got Thunder Wave from one side of an enemy to the other, whether or not it was magical... You had still been in the same boat, so it's not it's not a negative change. It's a positive change. It just still doesn't give Steve the ability to do something he would kind of like to do. I like to do all the things. It's true. All right, moving down several pages. We have a lot of unchanged things. Yes, going down to page twenty six. I see Rob has a note under knocking a creature out. This is, I think, kind of the equivalent of the the non lethal damage that kind of did and kind of didn't exist in 5e. Rob, why don't you tell us how they've addressed that issue in 1 D&D? This was one of the weirder things in 5th edition and one of the things that, let's face it, didn't come up as often and almost every time you went back and read how this worked in 5e, uh, someone was sad about it. It didn't come up as often. People are trying to do this in Almost all of my combats. Any time they think that they can question someone. Oh, really? They're not trying to just murder her with their way through stuff? Well, I, I need to trade players with you. They think I'm going to let them question the NPCs. No, uh, by the way, uh, DMs out there, if you have players like I do who want to question every humanoid enemy that they defeat and interrogate them for information, there's this little common magic item called Band of Loyalty that says whenever a creature gets knocked out, they automatically die. It's basically the magical equivalent of a cyanide pill. Give all of your humanoid NPCs that, and then you will remove that option from your, from your player characters. You can just let things die. And if they want to talk to them, they can cast Speak with Dead. They can cast Resurrection, man. Like, let's, <laughs> let's make a hundred gold investment in asking those questions. Ah, uh, well, you know what? At least that way it'll cost them something. I don't have a problem with this like Steve does. They're going to ask his name. They're going to ask his name, Rob. It's the first question. <laughs> But if your players do want to knock a creature out, it's never been easier than in 1 D&D. You can choose when you make a melee attack that would reduce a creature to zero hit points if you want them to die or to be reduced to one hit point and be unconscious until the end of a short rest. I like this. I like this a lot. Yeah. They stay unconscious until they get any healthier than they are, so if you need them to wake up sooner, it's a healing word or a pip of lay on hands, and you can start the questioning early, or you can apply some quick first aid. But, yeah, I mean, this just makes sense. A short rest begins automatically when you have at least one hit point and the unconscious condition. Doesn't it? No, that's di the dying condition. It does if they're knocked out, yeah. There's nothing about that in the unconscious condition. That's from the dying condition. Okay. Yeah, and that is a good distinction to make because if you were trying to kill someone and they wound up just being knocked out, it's going to take them longer to wake up than if you were trying to knock somebody out and they got knocked out. Yeah, so the, now it's a little bit more uniform. The short rest is going to give them hit points at the end, which will revive them from their unconscious condition, or you can do it early by making said medicine check or by giving them any extra hit points. This I like. I feel like this is simpler than whatever they had in 5th edition. Very good way to clean things up. State it simply. Use unconscious condition until they gain hit points, and short rests are what, like an hour? Pretty sure they're still an hour. So in an hour, they'll wake up. Speaking of resting, next thing to talk about is long resting. And this has had a few small changes to it. First of all, it defines kind of how long you can be awake and be doing some kind of light activity and still be able to count it as a long rest. It does continue the change that a long rest was now giving you all of your hit dice back that have been expended. Love it. Not just a fraction of them as it did in 5th edition. Goodbye, grittier games. And thank goodness. Now... When you take a long rest, you do not remove all levels of exhaustion. 
They have realized the error of their ways and gone back to removing a single level per long rest. Was that one of the changes that they made like somewhere along the way? Yes. Because I know it wasn't that way in 5th edition. Okay. I like that they've codified that you can't, and I think this was the way it was in 5th edition too, but you can't take another long rest until you've had at least 16 hours of being awake. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I like that they're using the unconscious condition to apply to anyone who is taking a long rest while they are sleeping. Unless you're an elf or something that you have to sleep for at least six hours during the long rest, you can stand watch with the other two hours. And basically, as long as combat doesn't come up or you don't cast any strenuous spells, then you're going to be able to finish the long rest just like you used to. And the way it's set up now, you can do that in eight hours instead of ten. Very clean, very simple. I like the way that they have set everything up. I hope it stays unchanged, unlike what they're doing to, you know, grappling and stuff. Just just leave it the way it is. When, when you get it right, just stop. <laughs> moving on down to moving around other creatures. Moving around other creatures. Uh, <laughs> this has been an issue for a lot of players who don't play halflings, who can move through the spaces of other creatures. This has needed some explaining to someone at every table that I've ever played at. Here, it is pretty well defined that you can move through the spaces of friendly creatures, the spaces of creatures who are significantly larger or smaller than you, and that moving through the space of another creature that is not your ally is considered difficult terrain. It also says that you can't willingly end your move in a space occupied by another creature, which does destroy the dream of getting up on the Hydra's back. Yeah, I've always felt like with the size that some creatures can attain in D&D 5e, that you should be able to Shadow of Colossus them, right? <laughs> you should be able to climb on their backs, stab them in the armpit, or uh, you know, crawl on top of their head and ride around. This categorically vetoes that. Um, I'm sure that creatures that have like swallow abilities and things, mm-hmm. they're just going to remove you from the map or something. I mean, because they have to now. Because if you're on the map... You can't exist inside that creature's space. And you know what? If you're if you're cool and you have a three-dimensional map and you have little ways to stand, maybe the space above a creature is on its back but not in its space. Oh, see, see, here's the thing. Because just like in 5th edition, there is no support for vertical movement. It is canonically possible, but they still haven't codified how to use it. That's one of the main things that I'm hoping to get out of 6th edition is flying rules. Like, you know, about distances and things. Because I do what makes sense. I use, like, a hypotenuse. Or I pretend that there are vertical spaces going up above the map. Kind of similar to what they do in, like, say, Critical Role or things like that. It's really easy to do on the play-by-post, uh, by the way. If anyone wants to know how to do it, you just, you know, come on the play-by-post. I'll show you how I do it. But per the rules of 5th edition, they don't they don't really tell you what you're supposed to do here. Some people still calculate the distance by going down and going across. And, and maybe at some point that was rules as written. And it, maybe it is now. But if it is, it's, um, it, I mean, where? Someone can probably tell me. But it, it doesn't make sense that way. So please, don't just define the fly speed in this glossary. Define flight, please. Anyway, I digress. Moving around other creatures is very well cleared up in this UA. But goodness, I mean, even me, if I, you put my little rapier in my hand that I have at home, I still only control like a, a 10 foot space, man. I can, I have long legs. I got long arms. Like, yeah. Okay. You know? well, we're both, we're both uh, six feet tall, tall, dark and handsome. Uh, by the way, uh, you can't tell because it's a radio, it's a radio program. Just assume the handsome, trust us on the handsome. But you know, we're about six feet tall and we're about two feet wide, like at the shoulders, right? So we don't take up uh, a five by five square. That's 25 square feet, okay? We don't take up that much room. It is entirely conceivable that people should be able to run back and forth through your space. Allies that you aren't going to care about have, you know, 21 extra square feet in that one square on the map to move around you. And this is just codifying the rules to allow them to do that. Weird that you can't exist in the same space as an enemy with all that extra room. But um, I'm guessing they're just doing it for the ease of using maps. Thank you for hanging in there. We got two things left to cover. First of all is telepathy. Telepathy used to be in the monster manual. It didn't used to be in any player-facing book because it wasn't a thing in player-facing books, not in the old player's handbook. Now it looks like they're giving you access to that more quickly 
and putting it in front of the players because it's something they're going to need to know. Telepathic creatures still need to be able to share a language with the recipient of their communication unless the creature is telepathic itself, and then they can just vibe together. I don't know. They communicate purely through thought and emotion, like whales. Also, much like with flying, incapacitation is going to prevent telepathic contact from now on, even though that's not a part of the incapacitated condition. Being incapacitated will end it if you are trying to telepathically communicate and prevent it if you'd like to start. Making telepathy equivalent to flight incapacitated won't let you do anything but walk <laughs> completely completely equivalent <laughs> yeah. there's nothing the same in every way no difference they're the same if you can fly you're basically a telepath gosh that's not true <laughs> so oversimplified <laughs> finally the last series of what we would consider to be significant changes in this play test packet goes back to the unarmed strike this is another one of those that I really felt like they got it in one, and yet here they are still tweaking things. Rob, what have they done to it? <laughs> what have they done? I literally don't know. It's been so long since I read this. <laughs> so if you want to grapple someone in 5th edition, you have to make a check and beat them at that check. Athletics to start, and they can combat that or contest that with their athletics or their acrobatics. They toyed with a moment with being able to hit your armor class, and then you were grappled. And I thought that was dumb, but Steve really liked having that option. Now, we have that option again. If you hit someone with an unarmed strike, they must succeed on a strength or dexterity saving throw, or have the grappled condition applied to them. You don't have to roll to attack anymore, that's done. But we're also getting away from the athletics checks and the acrobatics checks, Saving throws are now what matters. This is an interesting half measure fix thing. Okay, <laughs> it's, like it's, if so, something like a compromise, perhaps. I like it better than the fifth edition grapple because the fifth edition grapple was stupid. Just quite <laughs> frankly, it was dumb. There was no reason to ever even try it. This is better. Having people make saving throws is good. Strength and dexterity saving throws are usually pretty high for monsters. Mm -hmm. At least one of them will be, and they get to pick which one they use. So, Which means it's going to be a toughie. The only thing that kind of makes it still okay is that they have also reverted to costing an enemy their action in order to attempt to escape, rather than the previous version where they got an automatic escape attempt at the end of their turn. This is... A compromise. It's a compromise. I think it's fairly balanced. I'm not seeing any immediate problems with it. It fixes some of the things that were wrong with it in 5e, based on, like, you know, just the fact that now you can do it as part of an unarmed strike. There are going to be some classes that, you know, get to make extra unarmed strikes, like monks, who are going to be able to apply this without using their action. And so then you get extra chances to grapple your enemy per turn, like, say, using Flurry of Blows or something like that. That's going to automatically give you a couple of extra chances to make unarmed strikes, all of which you can use to grapple instead of do damage. And then once you apply it, then they're going to have to use their action to try to escape. So that's better. I don't feel like you could have made one of these two changes to grappled and unarmed strikes without making the other and still had it make sense. I think I just kind of liked the old version better. But if they kept this the way it is, I don't think that I would be terribly upset because they at least fixed the problems with it. It's just I, I don't like it as much as the other one. Well, you can also shove with an unarmed strike. That's one of the three options available to you. And it's also going to be a strength or dexterity saving throw with the DC being calculated the same way. Let me be clear, though. Now that you have the unarmed strike and we're adding the shove and grapple actions as part of of the unarmed strike umbrella, grappling and shoving will not apply to the smite spells that now trigger on an unarmed strike. They sp specify that you have to hit someone with an unarmed strike, and the only one with the word hit in the language at all is damage. You still have to actually strike with your unarmed strike if you want to use a smite or a smite spell. But it's nice to have those all kind of codified into one umbrella instead of having another action that you could do that you have to remember and another action that you could do that you have to remember. Right. So those were all the significant changes in the playtest document, as Stephen mentioned. 
Can I mention an insignificant we're done. change it before took, we go? It took months for us. To, you, you, okay, we're we're almost done with this playtest packet that we've been working on for like what two or three months now, or something like that. And you want to talk more about it? Yeah, sure, go ahead. I don't just care. just one more thing. Just one more thing. It's a really small thing. Go ahead. They have changed being unconscious so that now in one D and D. You can keep talking while you're unconscious. Untrue, because the incapacitated condition says you can't speak. Is that true? It is. I had ju- I looked no. it up because I saw your note. Oh no, I'm wrong. <laughs> it's the first time it's ever happened on the podcast. I've edited it out all the other times. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, that was worth sticking around for. Okay, Rob, what are your <laughs> impressions? I just noticed they lost the verbiage. Yes, well, they added it to the incapacitated condition that says that you can't speak, so now they no longer have to list it in the unconscious condition. Rob, what are your thoughts on this playtest packet as a whole? For those of you who don't remember, because it's been so darn long, uh, this one was the one that covered the druids, the paladins, and these new rule updates and spell changes. So I've kind of given my opinions on the druids and the paladins before, but I'll restate them here. Druids need to get away from wild shape to a certain extent i think that wild shape is not the most important thing about a druid i'm excited by a spellcaster a full class spellcaster with access to the primal spell list i wish that were emphasized more they don't need to be pushed in a direction of a thing that makes them give that up for something that is not equal to that especially in this new version of wild shape i'm glad they nerfed it so i'm never really going to want to use it except for exploration and infiltration, but that's fine for me because I'm more excited about the other side of the class anyway. I'm just going to have a lot of class features that don't excite me, so I wish they would change them. Hopefully the other subclasses will add in some of those for you because obviously the Moon Druid just kind of doubles down on Wild Shape, but with so many of the core Druid class features revolving around Wild Shape now, if you don't make that a part of your day-to-day life as a Druid, you don't have a lot of reason to be a Druid. I mean, yeah, that's kind of rough that the Druid is basically Primal Spell List and Wild Shape without a lot of extra identity added onto that. Like, I kind of feel the same way about them as I do with the Paladins, where the core feature that made people excited to play them in 5th edition was too strong. So they dialed it back in 1D&D, and they put so many limiters on it and made you recover they these put one in, limiter on it. <laughs> on Divine Smite or on Wild Shape? On Divine Smite. No, they no, they because you can't smite on the same turn that you cast another spell. They can't critically hit. They can't be cast on the same turn with the spell, and they can't be done more than once per turn. And that's the one limiter that I see is once per turn. Well, okay, so hold on, hold on. Is whatever else is going on once per turn for Divine Smite. You lose the extra damage that you get against the two most common enemy types. You can't do it more than once per turn. You can no longer double on a critical hit, and you can no longer cast another spell of any kind on the same turn that you do a Divine Smite, which means that you can't do the main, like, you know, Nova Damage Paladin thing where you add Divine Smite and another another Smite spell. So that's like four or five different ways that they have limited Divine Smite, and I think that probably it deserved two of them. And here's the thing that I feel about the Druid and the Paladin is that we have dialed back their core feature so much that I don't see a very compelling reason to play that class anymore. In the case of the Druid, it's all Wild Shape now, baby. Like, if you don't like Wild Shape, you don't play a Druid, and that means that you don't play any full caster with the Primal Spell List. And then with the Paladin, they took everything that was special about the Paladin, other than their aura, which they scaled back and pushed it back to 10th level. They took everything else that was special about the Paladin and gave it to the Cleric and made it better. They still get Lay on Hands. Lay on Hands also got changed. <laughs> I'm, I'm not necessarily going to say that it got worse. I'm just going to say they didn't take everything no, away. But they took, okay, but yes, they you, took you, the you, special you, stuff. <laughs> You, you've already soapboxed the Paladin a little bit. Yeah, I think that this is my least favorite UA that they have given us yet. I think that when they gave us all the expert classes, those were great. I felt very positively about all of them. When the Cleric came out, I, I kind of felt like the Cleric was fine. Standard. Yeah. Uh, when this playtest packet came out, it made the Cleric better. The Cleric is now really cool. But the two classes that they presented us with in this one They're not only worse, I think they're also less fun. And I could handle worse. Worse probably needed to happen, but they still need to be fun. They still need to preserve some sense of identity. 
Weirdly enough, the druid got identity out the ass, but it's not fun. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready to finish answering your question now. <laughs> okay, yes. About how I feel about this. I really only asked you to be polite because I wanted to talk about it. I really just wanted to say how I felt about it. <laughs> I stand by what I said at the end of the Paladin episode. If this is the Paladin that we get it, to play with in one D&D, I will be okay with that. No, it will not be as good at the things that it used to be good at as it was in 5th edition. But it is still going to be unparalleled as a support class. And maybe it's going to feel wrong to call the support class a Paladin or vice versa. But it is going to be able to do things that no other class can touch or rival or even imitate. Would I like to see it be a little more powerful? Yes, I would. I think that every class needs a way to be effective in combat, and the way that it's getting outshone by the cleric in this UA, it could stand to have a little bit of a buff, or maybe make the, pa the smite spells unique to the paladin again. That would actually go a long way, and it wouldn't take very much. But the paladin still has things to offer that nobody else does, and it's fine. Not great, but it's fine. Here's the weird thing, though. Like, if we're talking about the paladin and the cleric, which of those should feel more like a warrior and which one should feel more like a support class? Based on what we know from 5th edition, it should be the paladin as the warrior and cleric as the support class, but it doesn't have to be that way. Based on what we know from every edition of D&D &D leading up to now, based on what we know from Pathfinder, based on what we know from like World of Warcraft, ah. like the paladin is supposed to be the halfway point between a cleric and a martial class. Flip the script, Steven. Open your mind. While they do still have, like you said, some features that it's impossible for other classes to replicate, they have changed at a fundamental level who the paladin is. They have switched the paladin and the cleric. Well, they're doing that with the warlock and you're excited about it. Wait, wait, wait. They, and they've done that without taking anything from the cleric. This playtest material makes me excited to play a cleric, not a paladin, and it's the paladin. Well, you know what? We're about to get access to how weapons work and how martial classes work. Yes. Maybe that will make you feel better about the paladin. Maybe the next UA will make you feel better about this UA. No. <laughs> it might. It won't. <laughs> the next UA, it dropped today. We haven't had a chance to look over it yet. It is 50 pages long. I don't know how many episodes it's going to take us to go through all of that material. It gave us all three mage classes. The video where Kenrick and Crawford were talking about it had me jumping up and down in my break room, as I've already said earlier in this episode. The changes that they have in store for warlocks, for sorcerers, for wizards, every single change that they mentioned I am extremely excited about. The changes to the weapons and how they're going to be designing them and giving them all special features that you can activate with them. That sounds amazing. It's basically going to give everyone who unlocks the weapon mastery feature trait that we're going to be talking about soon the ability to impact the combat tactically like battle masters or like spell casters it's it's going to be amazing i think that once i get done reading this it is going to be my favorite playtest packet it's going to make me fall in love with fighters in a way that i frankly never did in fifth edition oh and that's the thing you said that it gave us all the mages it's also giving us the fighter and the barbarian and that's what rob is excited to look at i always liked them conceptually but i never felt like i wanted to play one now i think i'm going to want to play one one. And I think it's going to reinforce my love of warlocks and sorcerers and the stuff that they talked about for wizards sounds really cool. Wizards just didn't get a lot of class features. Their class feature was their spell book in 5th edition until you got down to like the Chronergy wizard and stuff like that, that. They got a lot of class features that didn't have to do with just copying down spells and stuff. So this one, from what I've heard, is going to get to do some really cool stuff. And I am kind of excited to try that out. As excited as I am to hear about the mages, I also am so nervous because whenever the design team get me excited about something, there's always a monkey's paw hidden in it somewhere. And I'm so hyped right now to be able to do it that I am worried that they are going to let me down hard somewhere. Well, guys, this is normally the part of the episode where we tell you to go and make your opinions known for the UA that we are discussing. But even as of the day of recording, much less the day that it is getting published, the playtest feedback period has closed. <laughs> this sets a bad precedent, and with the size of what they're giving us to go through for the next one, maybe we'll be able to crank them out where you will be able to give your feedback 
back then. I hope you were able to go ahead and supply your thoughts to Wizards of the Coast as they continue to make this new edition of the game for us. Uh, sorry about that. We'll, we'll try and be a little more on the ball for the next one. <laughs> Hopefully you guys realized that in the Paladin episode, I was just too optimistic. And you're like, let's not worry about what these guys are saying right now. Let's complain. <laughs> let's complain a lot. <laughs> let's make them fix the Paladin and make them cool again. And now hearing me say this, you're like, oh, thank goodness. I thought these guys had lost their minds. I've still lost my mind. It's fine. <laughs> and But I have a lot of Paladin hate <laughs> built up from 5e. But what are your thoughts on the Paladin? Even if you gave them to Wizards of the Coast, we haven't gotten them yet. What did you think of this particular version of the playtest? What did you think about the Druid? What do you think about these rules changes? What do you think about the Smite spells? Do you think, as Steve does, that the Cleric is now cooler than the Paladin? Let us know all that and more on our community Discord. Link in the description, as always. And when you stop by our community Discord, ask about the play-by-post game. Uh, we're probably going to do an episode about it in the near future, telling you about all the different things that we have on offer, some of the things that we're doing that not a lot of other people are to make that more exciting than your typical play-by-post or than your typical West March style game. We have plans. That, that was actually going to be the next thing on the docket was for us to talk about that until this UA came out. So now we've got five classes to go over. I don't know how we're going to work all this in. Um, we'll figure it out. That's, that's what we do. Um, but also in the description of the episode is going to be a link to MistyMountainGaming.com where you can get yourself some premium D&D dice, miniatures, dice bags, and more. Uh, my next order is already in the cart. Uh, they have come out with a new set of sharp-edged resin dice that have an explosion of colors on the inside that you can see right through the clear resin down into it. Those things look amazing. I've been focusing a lot on getting a whole bunch of metal dice because I never had any of those before. But I mean, guys, there are some really cool things you can do with the resin dice. And my, my next cart is filled with nothing but those. I have touched them. I have held them. I have seen them. They are immaculate. Do please remember to use code TWINS10 when making your purchases there. That helps support the show and saves you money. But if you just want to get yourself something from MistyMountainGaming.com, use the links in the description of this episode to follow us on social media. Misty Mountain Gaming has been kind enough to give us some of these dice to give away. So look for links that you can share and ways that you can help grow the podcast community, and perhaps you will get some free dice out of the bargain. All right, well, I think that is as much as I can talk about the old news without hitting the stop button and moving on to read the new stuff. When this episode comes out, it will already have been released for some time, so I know that you guys, if you're following along with us, you've already had a chance to take a look at it, crack it open, read through, and be ready to follow along with us as we explore the mage and some of the warrior classes here on the next episode of Bardic Twinspiration. If you enjoyed this episode and wish to hear more like it, please consider supporting us on Patreon or on Anchor.fm. You can also support us by using code TWINS10, that's T-W-I-N-S-1-0, whenever buying dice or other premium Dungeons & Dragons products from MistyMountainGaming.com. Or just by sharing us with your friends. If you'd like to join the conversation, please join our community Discord, or reach out to us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter links to all of that below the episode. And hey, in case you don't hear it anywhere else this week, we love you guys. Till next time. Pathfinder is uh, fantasy battle math times two. Pathfinder. Which is, again, it's times path, times is easier. Pathfinder. Path, I said Pathfinder. I said, go to the tapes! Just, okay. Go to the tapes! <laughs> okay, we will... <laughs> I will. This will be bloopers now. Pathminder is uh, fantasy. Pathminder battle. is Pathminder is Pathminder. Which I think is actually one of my new favorite phrases. Now that I say it, if I'm gonna, I'm gonna knock the glimmering smite out of you. <laughs> it, that sounds like something we would hear in the Bayou. And <laughs> knock the glimmering smite out of you. Anyway, is it, is it making you think of that uh, little firefly from Princess and the Frog? No, it's not. Oh well, then lucky you. Keep talking. I'm getting a drink. Okay. You want to say anything about that one? I think we're good to move on, right? Yeah. The, the thing that I do like about that is that, like, your ally with the telekinetic feet can't just give you a little tug and pop you out of the giant's hands. Oh, don't don't say that. Don't say that. It's not good. 
No. Well, okay, you you phrase that how you would like in your own mind. Your friend with the telekinetic fist. Give you a little tug. Long rest. Go ahead. I'm just amusing myself. Anyone keeping track at home, this is Steven's second soapbox of the episode. <laughs> we're, we're very close to the end. I don't know how we found it. I thought I hid the damn thing. You usually only get this out of me like once every several episodes. So, you know, <laughs> lucky you. Lucky you.